drag queens reading to kids in libraries, gender confusion promoted to kindergartners, babies left on the delivery table to die in the name of abortion. If you just look at the daily headlines, the cultural clash going on in this country can feel pretty heavy. But that's why as Christians, especially during the Thanksgiving season, it's important to take a step back and remember the ways God has had grace on this country. Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, with our president, Victoria Cobb. You know, I think I'm behind on this news, but I just saw in my Facebook feed that Amazon is apparently really pushing this whole palm reading payment thing. I mean, I thought I thought this has got to be a Babylon Bee story. You know, this is not real, but it was. It was real. Yeah, no, I don't think you're behind because if you're behind, I'm behind because I didn't know that. And I got to be honest with you, it stresses me out a lot. Like when I realized what they were doing, I... I mean, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I am not a, oh, the the end of the world is coming and that kind of thing. But I just sat there and I couldn't help but be drawn to the scripture about the mark of the beast. And I always thought that was something that would be put on you. But this is biometrics that you're using to pay. And if you're using your own biometrics to actually connect with your payment source, especially after we've just had COVID where we sort of watched the world kind of say, if you don't have a vaccine, you can't do X, Y, and Z. This whole thing, it scared me to death because I thought at least there'd be something you'd have to... I don't know. All yeah. I can say is this is disturbing. It's just a little too close to and that biblical scenario. And there's no real reason to do all this. It's just, I guess, to speed up technology, you know, just speed yeah. up payment or something. I mean, I don't need, I don't, they didn't need to go there. And even if you don't have all that biblical context, um, it's still very intrusive. It's personal. <laughs> it's your only unique identifiers are yeah. your eyeballs and your, yeah. your, your face. Your prints. Yeah. It's yeah. your, it's your, it's your facial reading and your prints. And I just don't think we need to all be in a database associated yeah. with payment forms in that way. Yeah. And yet we keep doing it. I mean, I did break down and do my, um, thumbprint or whatever on the Apple phone, you know, we just keep doing it. Just keep walking into it. So I haven't, I, I, I have not, I will do not that. do, I will not do facial recognition either at the airport or at the Apple. I'm sure that I'm barely holding anything back. The whole world already knows everything about me because I use an iPhone, <laughs> yeah. but I still just feel uncomfortable about those things. Okay. Well, if we get in the end times and we need shelter, Victoria is the place to go. <laughs> no, 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 there are people that actually have wonderful things like they grow food and they, you know, my house would not work very well for that. Plus you have an Alexa, so all hope is lost. A hundred percent true. true. It, it I hears do. everything. Yes. Well, in honor of the Thanksgiving season, I just wanted to try out a little quirky conversation starter question for you guys. And I'm just going to throw it out there first and see what people come up with, see how much y'all struggle. But if you had to choose a Thanksgiving classic food that best represents your personality, what would it be and why? Okay, so this is this is a tough one because mostly I think about all the pies at Thanksgiving. And I don't think people think of me as like the savor, like the super sweet on the outside kind of thing. And so I kind of had to roll all that out as I'm thinking about this. I don't know. I was I was thinking maybe like turkey because, you know, it's very plain. It's very to the point. But you can throw some gravy on top. You can, quote, dress it up, right? So, like, that's all I could think of is maybe I'm closest to the turkey. But that is a weird question. I'm not going to lie. You are not the turkey. <laughs> I don't mean that in a, a foolish way, like we call people a turkey. I just mean it's just straight protein, you know? All right. I I would say that you could be like the um, li- like lime key. Is it a key lime pie because you have a little zest? But that's not really Thanksgiving. <laughs> that's one. fun. Yeah, we don't eat key lime pie at my house for yeah, Thanksgiving. It's like totally uh, random. pecan that tastes like sugar literally melting in your mouth. <laughs> well, what are you? I am going to go with the crunchy green bean casserole i i do think i can kind of appear a little crunchy (laughs) on the exterior but if you get to know me a little bit i am you know deeper more complex inside than my initial crunchy surface as long as it's not too soupy like you know how when it gets made and you you know the aunt that makes it it's not quite you know it could be yeah or that (laughs) Catherine. i don't know my first thought is cranberry sauce oh yes and i don't know if that's just because that's my favorite meal like that's my i bring that every year but i guess you know it's sweet you know because you add sugar but also there's still a little zing to it and yeah yeah and it can be kind of organic which you guys are good at like with wellness or am i (laughs) I really doing a reach there (laughs) 
I don't know. Mine has sugar in it for sure. <laughs> I usually put in less sugar than the recipe calls for. Yeah. The recipe usually calls for a cup, and I'll usually do three fourths cup, maybe two thirds. I, I like it a little. I like it a little tangy. I like that one. All right. Well, Eli doesn't have a mic, but if we can kind of say what he's saying, if he wants to like kind of yell out his. Oh, he's gonna. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess I would be along the line somewhere around turkey or ham. And since Victoria said turkey, I'll go with ham. And the, the, the reason for that is in a world that the older I get, the more real, the more I realize that I'm quote unquote traditional uh, yeah. in a world that's trying to get faster, more convenient. Everything's changing. The culture's changing. Just give me turkey or ham. And I really think that uh, <laughs> m- me being more old fashioned in this quickly changing culture, I would go with I would go with the old staple of turkey or ham. And I should explain for our audience that Eli is our newest member on staff and he is adapting from just traditional life in West Virginia to more urban life in Richmond. So, yeah, that's that's a great answer. Well, getting into our topic, as we talked about in the intro of our show today, as believers, as Christians who really care passionately about the future of our country and biblical principles, it is easy to lose heart at times and just start feeling really heavy and burdened, especially if you are paying attention to the news headlines every day. Yeah, I, I every day I kind of feel like I read something that maybe is even worse than the day before. And I think, how does that happen? And especially when you have children, you're mindful if the news is on, you realize you don't want them to hear all that stuff. And then you realize you're hearing it all. You're processing hard, terrible stuff a lot. It's not not ideal. Yeah. And I do have moments when I think, okay, can we ever really turn all this around? Are we just too far gone? And But that's where the good news comes in if you're a believer, because the reality, the Bible does make it clear There is no doubt that God's principles, thank you, Lord, will win out in the end because they are based on something eternal, on God's eternal truths. That cannot be changed. The truth shall overcome. And that's why we thought it would be an important moment during this Thanksgiving season to just take that step back, take a deep breath, everybody kind of inhale and exhale, and recollect some of the huge ways that God has been merciful to our nation and state over the last year or so. Absolutely. And when I think about that, I think mostly about the life issue. I can't help but think about the life issue. Now, you know, if you're thinking about just this recent election and that you might be thinking, wow, this, you know, the abortion was in the news and it wasn't in the news in a good way. But really step back. This has been an unbelievable year for the unborn. And it's because of God's mercy that we were able to get a decision that we've been waiting for and working for for decades and decades and decades. And the fact that that enables maybe not yet Virginia, but some states to already go all the way to protecting human life from the earliest stages is pretty amazing. And then even in Virginia, where we haven't yet been able to do everything we want to do to protect the unborn, we're watching localities in southwest Virginia try to fortify their own borders, so to speak. I don't know if you can say that about little towns and, and counties, but they're really trying to say, in at least in our area, we don't want to become a destination location for abortion where Tennessee and West Virginia and those others have protected and they would come here. And so, I mean, that's pretty amazing to watch. And what a wonderful thing that people now can actually participate and be able to be effective in saving human lives, even within our own commonwealth. Yeah, because I really didn't think, part of me just thought it was surreal that it really wasn't going to happen when we saw that, you know, uh, Roe be overturned after nearly 50 years. And now, like you say, for people to actually be empowered to make decisions. So let's not lose sight of, of that grace, even though we're having challenges in the steps after that. But I am uh, curious what you think about also God's grace in the form of the next generation's Yeah, we are seeing more and more pro-life young people, whether you go to a state march or you go to the D.C. march and go to that national march, you just see, I mean, it is lined with students, with college kids and high school students and even just some of the younger leaders in the pro-life movement. When you think about um, people like Lila Rose, who were involved with live action and filming, you know, things that have become really exposés on the abortion industry. The one we had at uh, in, in Nova, the young woman. Oh, Isabel Brown. Yeah. She's an awesome voice that just seems to speak so well to Generation Z. You know, I just think that's yeah. awesome. And is it Abby Johnson? Is that her name? That's Yeah, Abby Johnson. I mean, she's, she's uh, you know. She's getting she, older she's, now. I, I don't want to say she's she's older than, the, <laughs> but she's older than those two that we were talking about. But she, but, but coming out from the industry and then drawing other workers who have been in the abortion industry to 
you know, come out of that and talk about their experience. That's a really yeah. big component of what why people now yeah. understand what actually happens behind an abortion door, you know, if you walk into a center. Yeah, we can't discount the Pauls coming out of this, like the ones that have that Damascus Road moment that we, we sort of think they're entrenched in everything and we discount the power of salvation, the redemption of Christ, but we haven't seen the whole story yet of people turning their lives around and walking out of some of this um, and then leading the way, like we see at the test, the testimonies of these city council meetings, with women talking about walking out of abortion. Um, so I think that's definitely the grace of God in our nation. Um, I do want to touch on parental rights. I do truly thank God for his grace in allowing our own state the Commonwealth of Virginia, to have this whole unforeseen role in awakening the rest of the nation. Who would have thought that would have happened? Um, that parents who, you know, just felt like they couldn't remain silent when it comes to this basic authority to protect their kids would just start appearing, you know, it's kind of like they were on the sidelines and then they just started getting into center court and led the rest of the nation. Yeah, I I. I didn't realize at the time, I mean, I could see the parental rights issue moving Virginia. I didn't realize it was going to lead a movement that would affect other states all across the nation. So that's been very amazing to watch, that it isn't just people in their own school boards. And it isn't even just our state election, that it literally affected lots of other things around the country. What would you say, Victoria, is the most your thoughts on the most hopeful thing coming out of the parental rights movement right now and where you see that going? Well, I think the fact that parents understand that their kids are not just getting reading and writing and math in the classroom anymore. I mean, that just for the longest time, I think people thought, well, I went to public schools and I had a good experience and I only learned about reading, writing and math. And all of a sudden, you know, people complaining that things are going on in the classroom. Now they saw for themselves in COVID or just through this parental rights movement. And I think just that realization that there's an indoctrination happening that is very, very harmful to their children just in and of itself is prompting more examination over every single thing that happens inside the classroom doors. And that's going to benefit our kids. Yeah. And I'll just share that. I mean, several years ago, <laughs> maybe more than 10 years ago when I was working at Focus on the Family, we were helping parents in Fairfax County. And at that time, that school district basically, I guess I would say outfunded them because they were trying to do FOIA's Freedom of Information Act about the books in the library and things like that. And they just kind of outcharged the parents for those FOIA's and had pretty much a brick wall that they ended up not being able to get through. And I looked at that and kind of discounted that area. And then here I am in Virginia all these years later, and you had these parents in Loudoun County and Fairfax, parent, uh, Fairfax County making the news in a viral way because they're speaking up about the explicit books. And you just you should never discount something or, you know, discount the power of truth, the, the power to redemptively expose darkness I mean, you've, you've got parents like Laura Murphy in Fairfax County that just led this whole parental rights law I, that we have. I know we've talked about her before, but that story should be so powerful for everybody because, I mean, she just tried to go to her teacher. It didn't work. She went to the principal. It didn't work. She went to the school board. She didn't get it done. She passed a law. She still got a veto, but she stayed on it. And now we have a law that helps everybody in the Commonwealth deal with sexually explicit content in the classroom. But it was just a mom that was persistent. Yeah. So we need God to help us be thankful for these ways that his grace still is protecting our nation, um, giving us ways to be salt and light in our communities, and at the same time have this Wilberforce mentality that we never, ever, ever give up. Want a chance to win a personal tour of the state capitol with Delegate Nick Freitas and Victoria Cobb? In celebration of reaching our 100th episode of Speak Up Virginia, we've made it easy for you to enter. Just go to FamilyFoundation.org and click on the Win a Tour banner. That's FamilyFoundation.org. All right. Well, we covered what we are thankful for on the parental rights and life fronts, but what about religious freedom? Well, we've had a court that has been slowly moving in the direction of religious freedom with some cases up at the Supreme Court. But to get the Coach Kennedy case, I feel like we have to start there for to be able to have that such a great decision that says, look, 
he is a teacher, but he is still a religious individual. He still has his own faith, and he can express that in the context of the public school. That's going to have unbelievable dividends in all sorts of other people's lives all across the country as they simply walk out their faith in a public context. So that's a big deal. But even on the smaller scale, we've got people who are challenging the system because their faith is evident and it is part of how they engage the world. And so we had the Tanner Cross situation. We had a teacher that simply said, I can't do what you're telling me to do because I am a person of faith and I'm (laughs) a PE teacher. You know, I actually believe boys are boys and girls are girls. And he just was willing to say that. And we, you know, there was a case that ultimately he prevailed. Um, And so that's a big one. And even Peter Vlaming, where we're not done seeing where that teacher's case will go, right? So he's the teacher that simply said, I can't use pronouns um, that aren't accurate, but I will try to avoid using pronouns. He got fired for non-use of pronouns, but he's in the middle of his case. But I believe that there's going to be such redemption through his story, because I think he will prevail ultimately, that he won't have to be compelled. And that's going to help a lot of Christians in other places. That was West Point High? That was or? West Point High. So that's a rural part of Virginia. It was a strange situation to think that sort of an area that you wouldn't expect to have so much controversy would fire a teacher who simply was trying to, you know, not have to engage that issue in the classroom. And he was so brave speaking out on some of these uh, national news stations recently because he was saying, look, I just want to teach French, but... I was being forced to do compelled speech. Like, he didn't want to make an issue of it. This is the thing. Most people are trying to live their lives but simply do what God has called them to do and be who God's called them to be and not succumb to deception or falsehood. That's all he was trying to do. And I think um, it's a model for other believers that are struggling when they are in particularly the public school system. I think of that as the most obvious place where there's sort of this sense of you better go along and get along with a left-wing ideology that is in conflict with biblical worldview. Well, speaking of that case, I am also thankful for our state attorney general, Jason Mieres, who filed a brief in support of that teacher's case. Uh, what's your take on that, Victoria? I know he's done a lot of briefs yeah. for religious freedom, right? Yeah, we have. We are blessed to have the attorney general that we have. I believe that he is willing to do the hard things to stand for religious freedom and other things. And so they filed amicus, you know, what they call friend of the court, Uh, briefs in a lot of these kinds of cases. And that puts us Virginians on the right side of these cases. Yeah, that's a nice change. Um, Well, just kind of continuing on this theme of challenges we've faced and God using those redemptively, I think we have to mention the the whole pandemic and how we not only experience the painful suffering of people that we loved. I know we lost loved ones, people that we cared about. but just also experiencing all the fear and isolation that came with that. But then on top of all that suffering we already had, we had these unprecedented attacks on the basic freedoms of our churches to just simply meet and worship. I think it was really a God thing that these that there were pastors courageous enough to have to say to the government, no, this is where the line is drawn. We're going to worship. We're going to um, still meet. They did creative things to meet. They they you know they basically said no. That is what we're called to do, and we're called to obey God before government. And I think that was really big. And we're getting to see in some of these cases amazing vindication of that. Um, you know, there have been some um, really big settlements that the government has had to pay up with regard to churches who simply fought the fight and stayed the course, and, and ultimately now it wasn't fun, but ultimately prevailed. You can kind of see maybe God's grace in that he allowed us to to have a foreshadowing of what can happen if we don't defend our freedoms, that it was so easy for those churches to get shut down and quickly. Um, but then God's grace in that he, he rose up people like these pastors well, to be that bellwether, to be that alarm. And some did it very openly out in public. But I even think of churches in Virginia where when Governor Northam was trying to decide what the limits were going to be, the number limit, he wanted to make a 25 person limit of who could go to church. And we had a group of pastors come together and approach the governor before that was solidified and say, 25 people, if you're talking about a mega church, you know, thousands meet here, you can have more than, and they got it to at least a percentage. I mean, they they were, they were working behind the scenes mm-hmm. in addition to the ones that had to openly defy publicly. Mm-hmm. Well, since we touched on all of these major issues, life, family, freedom, let's just bring the thing full circle. 
Can you help us gain perspective, Victoria, on the bigger picture of where we are kind of at in this society with these moral issues? And since I'm kind of on my, um, you know, one to 10 question kick, <laughs> um, what if we just look at it on a scale of one to 10? I know it's really kind of simplified, but if you were to rank our nation overall on its health, on these life, family, and freedom issues, what ranking would you give us and why? All right. Well, if it's, you know, low on the low end is one, high end is 10. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I think most people would look around and think we're in a really sad state when we um, want abortion desperately in our elections, when we have drag queens in front of children. Yeah. So I, I guess I'd have to say something like a two or three, because I just can't fathom why we worship um, the idols that we do in our nation and why we don't appreciate human life. But to that, I want to say, though, that people tend to forget that these things can be a pendulum. There can be revival. There can be turn backs. There have been in history in areas of the world where people have had terrible societies, had terrible moral structure, and they have come back a little bit. And so I don't want people to feel I don't want them to hear that number and feel destitute by what I just said that, oh, it's the end of the world and we're not you know, it's never going to get better. That's just not how I view things. You know, what struck me as you said that was in both those issues, the drag queen issue and abortion at the heart of it, it's about that we want to be God and have no restraints over sexuality, our ability to do any kind of sexuality, any kind of perversity that we choose. Um, it's funny how that sexuality issue and how we do not want to fear God in that area. Well, and we just lost our vision for what it was intended for so long yeah. ago. I mean, that started back in, I mean, you know, think about the 60s and the 70s. I mean, it, we lost our understanding of what God designed that to be. And once you lose that and you disconnect it from the family, you know, it's sort of, it's just been a, a downhill slope ever since then on how our society treats that issue and all the terrible consequences of misusing what, you know, God's gift to us in that way. Then it would make sense then that a core part of taking steps back would be communicating a biblical viewpoint on the gift of sexuality. Yeah. And I think, and I think we've mentioned this before, but that's, you know, our churches are a lot quieter on that than they should be. I mean, pastors are more reluctant to talk about that than we need them to be. So we're going to need some courage from the pulpit before we get uh, politicians that are voting for things that restore the moral structure in our society. Well, since we're kind of talking about what our conclusions are from this, why don't you give us just three or four takeaways that you feel Christians might want to keep in mind moving forward? Well, I think we have to be balanced in our perspective. So yes, we can realistically view culture as it is, but we need to be praising God for all the victories that come. Sometimes we lose track. And so I think it's been really good to revisit the things that we're thankful for. And I think that has to be a daily process for a believer because if you turn on the news that's all you if, if that's all you turn on is the news and you don't go to the lord in prayer and you're not thankful for all he's done you're going to get off balance and that is not only unhealthy for you as a person but if we have a lot of christians that aren't balanced we shouldn't be engaging in the political process because it's going to come out not the way it's intended yes i'm thankful for our families and that we still live in a free country where we can go to church and just have our marriages and our kids and our families and live in a biblical way. So I am thankful for that blessing. Yeah, of course. I can't, um, I, I can't say enough about the fact that we just are blessed over and over and over again in our lives. And um, you don't have to turn on the news to see that. Right? What are you That's, personally thankful for? Oh, man, I where to start. I mean, I have an unbelievable family. So, you know, you start with your kids because you just I don't know. It's just it's just the first your place you go. My kids energy. are I'm thankful so for great. Your kids I too. love my kids. I mean, <laughs> that sounds like the most overstated, like <laughs> obvious thing. But um, yeah, I'm really, really, really grateful for kids who, you know, overall they love the Lord and they, you know, they are just a, a great joy. They are. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a special treat to wrap up here. I mentioned Eli Osborne, our newest employee at the Family Foundation. He is going to lead us in a special Thanksgiving prayer for everybody. Um, and I'll just mention um, Eli comes to us, as I said before, from West Virginia, and he is our new grassroots manager. And he has awesome experience in grassroots engagement and policy, including working on the legislative team of Senator Josh Hawley. 
um, serving as the legislative liaison for his alma mater, Fairmont University in West Virginia. He's done mission trips, and I could go on and on, but we're thankful for him being on the team. I guess I will mention that his favorite sport teams are Cleveland Browns, Dallas Mavericks, West Virginia University Mountaineers, and hopefully that doesn't cost him any friends on this show. (laughs) But Eli, with that, do you want to lead us in a final prayer? Yeah, thank you so much, Candy. God, we just thank you for this time of year where we're meant to slow down and be thankful. Lord, we thank you for being the designer of the family and for forming it as the first institution in this world. We know how foundational the family is for the success of children and society as a whole. This Thanksgiving, please bless families and renew us, Lord. Bring prodigals home and keep the families at peace that have new empty seats this year from loved ones that they've lost. Above all things, Lord, we lift Jesus up and know that all good things come from you. Thank you for grace on this country, grace on our families, and grace on us individuals, and, and for the, the eternal sacrifice and the, and the perfect sacrifice of the cross, Lord, where Jesus shed his blood for our sins. Thank you for freedom where we can worship you in this country, Lord. Be with us this Thanksgiving season. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we head out here, I just want to remind everyone, don't miss your opportunity to enter for a chance to win our Win a Tour giveaway where you can have a chance at getting a personal tour of our beautiful state capitol with our president, Victoria Cobb, and Delegate Nick Freitas. Just go to familyfoundation.org and click on that Win a Tour banner. It's easy to enter, and by doing so, you can help us reach more people to learn about our podcast and get educated on the issues. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.